I'm talking to Charles Mallet, uh, who is the proprietor and sole member of Force Brewery uh, at the brewery headquarters in Love in the Lovelane Estate. Charles, micro breweries are a reasonably recent phenomenon, aren't they? They are, Chris. Although I think my definition of microbrewery is perhaps a bit more particular in that I believe a microbrewery, to be truly defined as such, should be somewhere that beer is brewed and consumed. There are a lot of small breweries in the United Kingdom now, but I think I feel that a microbrewery, and this is perhaps, uh, funnily enough, an Americanism, but I feel that it's either a brewery that has a bar added to the front of it or a bar which has a brewery built onto the back of it. The, the purpose of either being that you're enabling your beer follower or your drinker to have a closer association with both ends of the of this production spectrum. So here at Force Brewery, I have very particularly chosen a, a space that enables me to do that with the brew house being relatively small downstairs, although I struggle to contain all the component parts in that space. Um, and then the upstairs where we are now is open to the public on a Friday and for tours sort of during the week. So yes, um, th- there are a lot of small breweries, but I think a fairly minuscule number of breweries doing what I'm trying the, to do. The, the others seem to be in a garage or in a shed in the pub garden. I think so. The, yes, I mean, I suppose the really the really small brewers are exactly that. Often uh, a space that has previously been given over to something else is taken on and used as a, as a space within which to brew. Or they are going at it at a you know, purely commercial level right from the start, which means that you do have to have a large amount of space because you've got to, you've got to get a lot of beer out the door in order to make it viable if you're going to be selling into the trade primarily, which is what most small and large brewers do. And so the idea here was to change the template slightly and hope to sell the beer directly in smaller volumes and therefore the output would need to be not quite so large in order to to manage that. So um, that's the where, where was the where travel. was the light bulb moment for you? Uh, well, I don't know that it was necessarily light bulb. Probably a bit more candle powered, but <laughs> it was in my last army posting, which was uh, several years ago now. But I was based in Nairobi, which is a part in a part of the world that I previously knew quite well and no even better now and I had considered leaving the army and staying in that part of the world and I was always struck when coming back on leave by the number of people who would ask you questions like um, can, can you get Marmite there and uh, can, you know as though life could not be bearable without certain things and uh, not being a particularly fussy eater I, I've had no I've never really had an issue with the food anywhere in, in, in any part of the world uh, but the one thing that East Africa or perhaps all of Africa does lack is decent beer so I thought if I was going to stay in that part of the world brewing beer on a small scale bearing in mind the demographics in specifically in, in Nairobi and the number of people who've been exposed to British or European drinking culture would make a business viable. And actually, funnily enough, this was an idea I had, oh, I suppose, five or six years ago. And having, I've just been back out to that part of the world earlier this year, and there are now a couple of organisations doing exactly that. So that, so which is quite pleasing in in some sense. But that, that was that was the initial moment at which I thought about that, but only in a very it's general sort of you know, raised into spectacle type way. Um, it was after after that process, after taking a course at the Agricultural College here, that I began to think more specifically about a business that I'd be able to establish in this part of the world and it, and really re-immersing myself in British culture and finding out how much, not just the 
production side of it, but but how much the public's perception of small scale food and drink had changed. People really did seem to be interested in it, and it it, it wasn't just an interest. There was quite clearly uh, a way of making one of these systems work as a as a business. So um, so I think that's really how it struck me. The course at the, at the at the ag. Yeah. That wasn't in beer making. It was not in beer making, no. We touched on, uh, I suppose, aspects surrounding it. No, it was, a, it was an MBA. It was a small business school as part of the no university. So the course I took was an MBA, but it specialised in food and agriculture. So we had specific modules on... I mean, it actually was fascinating because it, it, it was the sort of Nestle's and Crafts and Coca-Cola's but also going right down to small-scale producers and even looking at case studies of farms around here and, and how people can do things a bit differently. I think, I think the, both the food and agricultural sectors, if you're going to make something work now on a small scale, you've got to be creative and inventive because I think that such is the pull of the, the bigger players that... If you're if you're going to produce a similar product to the bigger players, well, you, why bother? You, you've got to have something different about you and your product because ultimately you're going to have to price it differently. Yeah. So yes. you, you've got to think about, it. and that, in, in that respect, that that course was very very useful. And also at a, at a time where I wasn't committed to anything else then, and I think. Uh, now, now that I'm in this situation, I feel I'm at least I've got something. Like, I, I'd rather assume that once I'd started a business, I wouldn't necessarily be able to get off that treadmill and then go and do a full-time course in business administration. So to get the course in first, even though, yes, of course, on a daily basis, I'm not really examining the sort of economic factors involved in producing beer on such a small scale. But in time, all these things become more and more relevant. So it was very useful and also a great place to be and get a good grounding again. I grew up in this area, but to be back here on, on a more permanent basis and, and to understand how things are now uh, or how things were then, because even now, I mean, you know, being just off Love Lane for what's been nearly 18 months, it, it's changed, you know, constantly through that period. People come and yeah. people go. Yeah, well, they, they do. I mean, I think... Uh, less of the going. It seems that an awful lot of new buildings have sprung up where previously there were none or old ones have been knocked down. Just you know, opposite here, the, the unit that we're in now, that's a new build. This this was a um, fairly ramshackle mm -hmm. set of units years ago and, and otherwise just a yard. So I think there's, there's an awful lot more that's come onto Love Lane and therefore a lot more people travelling around here looking for all sorts of things. And... and um, surprisingly, or I found it surprising, um, a lot of them are to do with food and drink, aren't they? They are, yeah, yes. increasingly so, yeah, which yeah. is really encouraging, I think. Uh, and, I, and I think, I hope, bears out what, I mean, as I said earlier, the sort of philosophy that you've got to a, a adopt if you're going to try and make it work, which is to, to do it a bit differently. And, um, but certainly... The fact that there are other food and drink producers on the estate makes life, hopefully, makes life easier for yeah. all of us. Yes, yes, yes. Now, you're selling partly into the trade and partly to retail customers. That's yes? right, yes, yeah. Is, is that split controllable or...? It, it is controllable to a degree. Um, human beings are incredibly unpredictable <laughs> but the uh, the last year or so has given me a bit more of an idea as to I think uh, times of year that that drink is required um, in I suppose certain packages I mean I I, I do bottle beer uh, which obviously has a shelf life and so therefore that's that's fairly straightforward because People arrive; they take how much they want. There's no there's no need for a, any sort of prior arrangement or whatever. Uh, the only the only thing is that the lead time for me to 
build that stock back up again is is significant to to, to produce uh, bottled beers to be ready for drinking it does take a while so you are you are guessing all the time with that um, but otherwise the amount of beer that might go out for parties weddings that sort of thing uh, that is sort of overall predictable you you'd anticipate that between I suppose April and October you're going to have a large volume of that going out primarily based on people having outside, outdoor events mm. and, uh, and and that sort of thing but that's absolutely not to say that there won't be surprising peak times outside of that so uh, it, it is uh, it is a permanent challenge to work out exactly how much of something you're going to sell because the other thing is it's not just as simple as having stock I at the moment produce four different beers and of course each time I brew the same quantity comes out but they're not sold at the same rate so that's a an, an added challenge and bearing in mind to do that you're, you've got a two week two to three week period between brewing the beer and being able to drink it it, it, it does um, yeah it exercises the, the grey cells um, <laughs> yeah I mean you've got to market it yourself haven't you absolutely yeah and the um, the setup here in commercial terms brewing volume is very small but as I said earlier the intention was to keep that small mm. but to, but by having that split between the trade and direct retail sales it, it, it is it's a viable thing to do a viable way to approach the business but there's uh, I suppose a, a constant challenge of, of trying to evaluate exactly what's you know what's going to happen next and uh, and how things might be changing without your influence guiding it or, or with it um, but but by starting at a, a small scale I was hoping that word of mouth sales was, was going to be the word of mouth marketing was going to be the, the strongest um, path and, and actually that has proved to be the case and that's well, when we say selling into the trade do you, do you mean the, the licensed Vittler's trade or do you mean supermarkets um, no 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 not supermarkets I mean I, I couldn't possibly deal with supermarkets yeah. um, and not just ideologically but uh, <laughs> no simply the, the volumes that would be required the volumes and also the it's a funny one supermarkets have very very stringent regulations in, in some senses rightly so for the production of all their food and beverage I mean, you know, the, the, the audits that need to be conducted into the processes that have gone through essentially that's to do with uh, hygiene uh, you know, health hygiene all, all that side of it but I think they're in danger well, I suppose I speak to Brewer but I think they're, they're certainly in danger of ruling out taking on some very good beers just because they they won't deal with organisations that are perhaps as technologically sophisticated as as others because that's that's really what it boils down to. I mean, just because the the process by which things are achieved here is a bit more prehistoric doesn't mean to say that the resultant product is not just as good, if not better, than than a lot of what you you might find. So no, I trade wise, um, some of the bottles go into nearby shops but otherwise in volume terms it's mainly casks of beer going out to free house pubs and then and then there's the, the sort of in between area which is beer festivals so n- not exactly trade but but sort of more trade yeah. related um, and and you know a huge number of beer festivals happen every year now all over the place and, and they depending on who runs them but you never know where the beer might be might be off to next yeah. Yeah. which is great very exciting You've been telling me that uh, this week, uh, on Thursday, you're brewing something rather special. Indeed. Well, it, it, it should surely turn out to be. Yes, this Thursday, the 18th of June, is the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. And as part of a collaborative process with a so-called gypsy brewer, 
So a gypsy brewer is somebody who doesn't have their own brewery but wants to produce beers according to their own tastes and their own recipes and so I um, allow the Egghead Brewery to, to brew on site here and, and actually Giles at Egghead has done very well with, with the beers that he's produced so far. So he and I are collaborating on a, a specific Waterloo beer. We're actually going to do a couple, but this on, on the day we're brewing uh, to commemorate the bicentenary. Um, we both have our reasons for doing so. Mine, very particularly, is that uh, I was in the Coldstream Guards and it was the Coldstream that closed the gates of Hougamont Farm at the Battle of Waterloo and it is recognised by most historians as being the defining action of the battle. So it is of huge significance. The other thing is that with the with a certain amount of the proceeds of the sales of, of this particular beer, I will aim to support a military charity for which I'm an ambassador, and they operate specifically with homeless and destitute ex-servicemen within Gloucestershire. So the charity is called Elabore, they're based down in Salisbury, and they have homes in a lot of the counties in southwest England but um, I've been an ambassador for Elaborate in Gloucestershire for the last couple of years and they've got two homes in Gloucester now where they are able to take homeless ex-servicemen and essentially dust them down and rebuild their confidence. A lot have suffered from various mental traumas and other sort of associated uh, effects um, substance abuse and, and all those kinds of things but the, the, for a for me, the, the uh, enormous advantage of Elabore is it's not just to do with sustaining people who are on hard times. It's actually turning them around and putting people in a position where they can go back out and rejoin the workforce. And that's an amazing thing. And I've, I've seen that now in the two homes that they've got in Gloucester now, both of which are relatively new in the scheme of their veterans programme. But um, the work is, is phenomenal, and, and also Elabore is, a, is a, a sort of well, what you might call a frontline provider. So it's not as though they just find the veterans and then hand them over to somebody else. They, they look after them themselves and send them on courses, and they just engender incredible sort of feeling of, of community, or a small community within these homes and, and all that kind of thing. So part, as I say, the, part of the proceeds of the sales of the beer brewed in uh, commemoration of the Battle of Waterloo will go to support Elaborate. So there's a nice sort of, you know, circle there. And every Friday, well, first of all, um, when can people come here and buy your beer? Well... In short, on a Friday afternoon, from 2 o'clock until 9 o'clock on Friday, and that is a period of time during which people can come in, look at the bottles, taste beer, take away whatever they want, or come and collect an ordered quantity of, of what's called bright beer. So that's beer that's been taken out of a, an open cask, so it's fresh from the cask, it's gone into a container, and it needs to be consumed fairly shortly after it's collected from here but that that's obviously you know as I say it's all ordered in advance or people come in and drink on site so the premises is licensed for all regulated activities uh, so <laughs> boxing and wrestling <laughs> yet to take place here but it's only a matter of time surely um, and um, it, it's the, the purpose of the sort of having the one slot on Friday is partly because that gives me the rest of the week to do all the necessary things during the, the Brewers' Week, basically producing and packaging the beer, plus everything else that goes with that. Um, and having one fixed point in time, bearing in mind that we're all creatures of habit, and, and regardless of what the medics say, people do tend to drink more at weekends and think about beer more at weekends, so... Having having open time on Friday is great. It makes sense to people, and it's a fixed point in time. And I think because a lot of people ask, well, you know, why don't you open every night? 
And apart from the fundamental issue of the... Well, you saw the, the uh, various articles in the way downstairs. Um, a, apart from the, the problem of sort of clearing everything out of the way to make it easy for, for the public to be on site, I think the issue with that would is the, the sort of the lack of exclusivity, the lack of the sense of there being an occasion, an event, you know, fr- Friday at Force Brewery, and, and yeah. that's, that's really what it's about, and that's what I like, and there's a, you know, there's a strong, regular crowd, and you know, it just, it's something that you associate with the end of the working week, and all that kind of thing, it's just, it, it's, it's fun, and also, it's, it's worth my while, I, I would know whether it's me pulling the pints, or if I'm staffing it by using somebody else, I know that it's worth my while, I know it's worth the business's while, how many people would turn up on a Tuesday? Probably not very many. I mean, I might be quite wrong, but for, for now, it seems... Do you have a music licence? I do, yeah. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. traditional adjunct yeah. of drinking. Yeah. Well, in, indeed. No, no, when we've had, there's, we've had a um, fantastic inaugural musical performance here um, a couple of months ago. It was, fant- it was a real big hit. It was superb. And um, more planned. Right. Yeah. It, w- it wouldn't be averse to people making a pitch to you to play here? I would be delighted to hear anybody making a pitch to play here. I really would. It's, I mean, and apart from anything else, the, the acoustics up here, I believe, are good. So, yeah, I mean, it, absolutely yeah. ideal. It's great. Yeah. And, 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 and it's another, you know, I'm, I'm all for the mutual benefit of doing these things. If, if a musician, a local musician, wants to come here, then that's a brilliant reason for more people to come to the brewery on a Friday night. Good, good exposure for the brewery, but also great exposure for, for a musician who might not be known by people who would ordinarily drink here. So well, I, I, th- I think the ambiance has a character all of its own, um, mm. and I, I would love to uh, think that this was a regular venue for people... Charles, thank you very much for talking to me. I think there's much more to be said, and perhaps Corinium Radio will come knocking on your door again. But uh, in the meantime, thank you very much. Not at all, Chris. Thank you very much indeed for talking to me.